Amen, amen. When considering our natural or physical body, there's different types of pain. But let me narrow that down even further. If there's an injury, a, a, a leg injury, a back or an arm injury, it hurts. I know many in this church who've had who've had surgery on a, a joint or on your back or until you have that surgery, you're in a lot of pain. And, and you know when you continue to walk or move around in your head, you know you're just causing more damage. Janelle, when she hurt her back and ultimately had to have surgery, she had pain from the injury and an ongoing pain. She didn't know when she was moving and walking if she was doing additional damage to her back, which she probably was because her body was yelling out, pain, something's wrong here. After she had the injury, guess what? Or I'm sorry, after she had the surgery, guess what? She still had pain. But it was not the pain of an injury. It was the pain of recovery. I remember her saying something like this. Oh, it still hurts, she would say, but it's a different kind of pain. Because you know this pain is just temporary. You're going to get through it, and it's not causing any, any more damage. You are recovering. Some of you that have knee replacement surgery, and hip replacement surgery. Some of you are bionic people in here. But before the surgery, you were in pain. It hurt to move. But after the surgery, there was still pain. And then they sent you to physical therapy. And I've heard stories where you were convinced the physical therapist was indeed secretly trying to kill you. However, you were able to endure. Or you wanted to endure because... You knew you were on the path to getting better. They promised you it's going to be so much better. You're going to be so thankful you did this. But there was pain in the recovery process. After the surgery, the surgeon's done. She smiles and says, everything went perfectly. She walks out of the room. Her job is done. And you are left with pain. Sometimes even more pain than you had before the surgery. I thought it was going to feel better. I thought it was not supposed to hurt any longer. While you're in the hospital, sometimes they give you, you know, those goals. When you're able to do this, we'll let you out of the hospital. Or when you're able to do this, we'll release you to drive or go back to work. Well, Laying in that bed coming out from under the anesthesia, laying really still, you feel all right. You feel pretty good. All you have to do is walk down the hallway and walk back to your room, and they'll let you go home. That was the goal. That's all they gave you. No biggie. Nobody wants to stay in the hospital. You want to go home, swing your legs over the side of that bed, stand up, walk down that hallway, and back to your room sounds easy. You had surgery. You fixed the, they fixed the injury. The surgeon said everything went perfectly. You're fixed. You're better. Let's do this thing. Let's get out of here. Let's get home. You get to the part of swinging your legs over the edge of the bed. You, you may need a little help, and you understand that. Cause you, you may still be a little groggy from the anesthesia. You stand to your feet, ready for the walk of victory to the end of the hall and back to your room. And oh, 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 I thought the surgeon said everything went perfectly. Something must be decidedly wrong. The level of pain can be so intense, even worse than before the surgery. This can't be right. Yeah, your good intentions of walking down the hall and has quickly turned to a baby step towards the door and then sweat breaking out everywhere and heart pounding about to pass out and you're asking, you asking for help to please get me back in that bed. Just because the injury is fixed does not mean the pain is all gone. 
just because you took it to the Lord in prayer and left it at the altar does not mean you're completely whole. Just because you have forgiven does not mean you don't feel pain where the surgeon removed that bitterness. So often our lives involve pain. Pain because sin is in the world. Pain because the enemy is out to kill, to steal, and destroy. Pain because some people aren't kind. Pain because hurting people, they hurt people. Pain because of a misunderstanding. Whatever the injury, take it to God, that's right. Take it to the great physician. Let him do the necessary surgery, the necessary work on you. Lay it at the altar and leave it there. But I think sometimes we get confused because when we get from up from the surgery, the place of prayer, the powerful service, we may be okay for a bit, but then the pain still hits. Wait, I thought this was over. I thought I left this with God. Why am I still hurting? I'm trying to help someone to know what to do when there's still pain. When it still requires some physical therapy, some spiritual workouts that aren't fun, they aren't easy. They're painful. Go with me, if you would, to the Word of God. We're going to go to 1 Samuel here in a bit, but let me, let me set some things up, and it's going to take me a while to do this And uh, before I read the verses that I want to preach on today. But this is after David was anointed king when Samuel came to, the, to Jesse's house and anointed him king, but he went back and started watching sheep again. And it was during the time between him getting uh, being anointed and him taking the throne. And during that time, Saul, the king, had backslidden and he was out to kill David. And Saul and his army were on the hunt looking for David. David knowing he had a calling. David knowing he was anointed. But David living in caves and running, trying to stay one step ahead of, for his life, his, con, his life constantly in danger. We have 1 Samuel 21.10. And David arose and, and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Gath was in Philistine territory. It was in enemy territory. David was so desperate he went to an area that people hated him, were hostile towards him, people he had fought and won victories over and defeated. They lived there, and David was just a fugitive looking for, for, for safety. The servant, or the, I'm sorry, the, the, the servants, yes, of King Achish, they said unto him, wait a minute, king, do you know who this guy is? This is the David that everybody sang the song of Israel. They sang it, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. That's this guy that you just let come on over here. This is the giant slayer. 1 Samuel 21, 12. And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. Now running from King Saul, he goes to Philistine territory. They figure out who he was. Now he's running from that king. How would you like to be running from two kings with their armies? He gets out of there and he, he flees to the cave of Adullam. More running, more pain, more injury, more upheaval, more misunderstanding, more bad reports, more heartbreaking news during all of this. Samuel dies. Less stabilization in his life, less comfort, less direction. I don't know how long it was, maybe a year after David tried to flee from Gath in the land of the Philistines that we have 1 Samuel 23, 5. And it says, so David and his men went to Kali and fought with the Philistines, the people he tried to escape to. Now a year later, he's fighting with them. And he defeated them and brought away their cattle and smoked them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Kala. Then Saul finds out David's there. So here goes Saul on his entourage running after David again. David takes off running. So again, it seems like David may be running for another solid year. And then we have 1 Samuel 27, 1. David said in his heart, 
I shall not perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. And Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. David, you tried this before. You're going to try it again. Going back to the enemy's camp to try to find some relief. Okay, rabbit trail. But remember my rule, it's not a rabbit trail if it's in my notes. So it's in my notes. So let me throw this in here. Woe to any Christian or any church or any pastor that someone would have to leave and go to the enemy's camp because it's safer there. Can I remind this church? We are the sanctuary. That means we are a shelter, a protection, a safe place. We're here to show the love of God. We're here to lift one another's burdens, not be a burden. We're here to help recover, not to injure. That's what this church is about. Back to David. Running from Saul, he went to Achish the first time, Philistine territory. They found him, so he escaped again to the caves. Fought a year later, he fights the Philistines, takes a great defeat. Saul finds out he's there. David's on the run again, goes back to the Philistine territory, and 600 of his fighting men. I can only assume this time when he came marching in with his entourage that the king, King Achish, had heard Saul was fighting David, so figured they were at odds to one another, and so he figured that David was now maybe on the Philistine side, and so he asked him to come in. He welcomed him, and they, they, they were were all there together. King Achish this time again welcomed him there and over the course of time he, he David went to King Achish and said if I you know if I've been good to you and not caused any problems and, and found favor in your sight can you give me a place out in the country? Just give me a city out in the country where me and my family and all of us can live. We don't want to be in the royal city. We don't, want to, we don't deserve to be in the capital city with you. So the king, Achish, in enemy territory said, fine, I, I'm going to give you Ziklag. And so he went, and, and David lived in Ziklag a year and four months. Now watch. David's still injured. He's still running from Saul. And running from Saul in our story at least two years now, and now stays a year and four months in Ziklag. So we're talking three and a half years almost, short timing, that David's still been injured. You can't go back to your homeland because Saul's going to kill you. Do you remember Jesse coming in that, Jesse, your daddy coming and calling you in and Samuel the prophet there. You remember coming in that house and Samuel saying, he's the guy and anointing him king. You remember that. You remember you were told that you would be king someday, but all that was a long, long, long time ago. All you have done in recent years is run and get hurt and be misunderstood and suffered loss. David was ruthless though. Even while in the enemy territory, he was still destroying the enemy behind the scenes and secretly fighting them. The king Achish didn't even know about it. We get to 1 Samuel 29. The Israelites and the Philistines, arch enemies, were coming out to battle one another and marching to war. 1 Samuel 29, 2 says, And the lords of the Philistines passed on by hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed on in the re-reward with H's. The rearward, I'm sorry, the rearward with H's. They were all in the very, very back. All of a sudden, the princess of the Philistines looked at King Achish and said, what are these Hebrews doing? We're marching out against Israel, and they're coming with us? King Achish said, oh, this is David. This is, this is David. He's been with me a long time. 
He was the servant of King Saul, but, but he's been good to me. He, he's been with me several days. Oh, check that, time flies. He's been with me years now. They've done well. Well, he's done nothing wrong since he's been with me. The Philistines said, no way. Get him out of here. They're not going with us to fight against their own people. What better way to get back in good with King Saul than to start attacking us in the back while they're attacking us in the front? This ain't going to happen. This is not a good strategy. No, send them away, King Achish, immediately. 1 Samuel 29, 5. Same song, second verse. Is this not David, of whom they sang one to another in dances, saying, David has slew his thousands, Saul has slew his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. King Achish goes over to David. I'm sorry, guys. They, they don't trust you. Imagine that. You can't argue with us, and I can't argue with them. Go in peace. No hard feelings, just go your way. David tried to, come on now, that's not right. We can go with you. And King Achish said, sorry, the superiors have spoken. Just, just get up early in the morning as soon as there's any light and just, just head off and go home. So that's what David did. He and his guys were with him. Got up very early the next morning going home. I don't know how long it had been since David and his men had been at Ziklag. But the Bible says they traveled for like three days. So if they travel from where King Achish sent them home. So if they came to King Achish, and it took them three days to get there, and they spent a night and went back, and it took them three days, if just that short amount of time. They were gone from sick like at least six or seven days. Gone from their family, gone from their own homes for six or seven days. So here they come back. These men kicked out of their homeland. On the run from King Saul, these men running for their life, these men were now told, get lost. You ain't fighting with us. These men had fought. These men were tired. These men now traveled from that point home three days of walking. The injury just seemed to be worse. No healing in sight. What more is being damaged in all of this? Finally, and you say thank God to the verses I want to start preaching from. 1 Samuel verse chapter 30 verses 1 through 3 and then we'll head through these verses. Let's do 1 through 3 together. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag, finally getting home on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either small, great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. No, this cannot be happening. Just about as low as I can get. Just about as weary as I can get. But they have come home now. And they're getting ready to see their houses. And they're getting ready to see their families. And sleep in their own beds. And have a nice hot meal and enjoy the families. But the closer they got, something seemed off. There should have been noise. Daddy had been gone at least a week. There should have been children coming, running out. Daddy's home. There should have been wives racing towards their fighting hero husbands. Nothing. Only some plumes of smoke above the city. They run in. Charred wood everywhere. Glowing embers, but no people racing to where their homes used to be, checking through the wreckage, toys left in the streets, the, the smell of smoke everywhere in the air, injury, compounding on injury. How much more can they take? Verse 4, then David and the people that were there 
with him, lifted up their voice, and wept until they had no more power to weep. Think about that. That's distress I don't like to experience. Maybe you've been in those places. Maybe you're in that place where you have cried until you thought your head was going to split open. Where you have cried until your stomach muscles hurt from the heaving of heaviness. Your very body aches from sorrow and you had no more tears to cry. That's the picture of brave, valiant men. Verse 5, and David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. Verse 6, and David was greatly distressed. Oh, do say, I can only imagine how terrified and distraught he was. But we need to read on. He wasn't greatly distressed just over the scene. It was this next part. For the people, the guys that were with him, the guys on his side, for the people spake of stoning him. Why? Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his son's and his daughters, they were hurting so badly that they were going to hurt someone else. Hurting people, they hurt people. It was a terrible scene. But we can't stop reading yet. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David strengthened himself in the Lord. But David got courageous in the Lord. But David got some of that though he slay me mentality in the Lord. David slung one leg over the hospital bed David got some of that, though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear tenacity in him. Here comes the other leg over the side of that bed. David, settle down. David, you're weak. David, maybe you're not thinking straight from all the pain. David, you've been kicked down so many times. You have a right to sit there and just cry. David, you're fighting. Men are upset. I don't think they're going to go with you. They're about to turn on you. I don't think they're going to help you. They don't trust you, David. Everything is against you, David. Just take a break. Get back in bed, and maybe we'll try this later. What are you going to do, David? Verse 7. Bring me the preacher, and we're having a prayer meeting. Verse 8. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? David didn't know where they were, didn't know who they were, didn't know if his family was still alive. David had just made up his mind he was not going to sit there and do nothing. And God answered David, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. The pain is still there, but you are going to recover everything. David, it will be a full recovery when this is done. The injury was severe. The pain was debilitating. People betrayed you. People hurt you. And when you were down, they kicked you some more. You fought 
big giants. You conquered great cities. But when you got home, all hell was unleashed on you. You preached the sermons in public, but the enemy was destroying you in private. You thought you were doing everything right and doing your best. But there was some friendly fire. There was some injury from those you trusted. And you are hurting very, very badly. I know it's been a long time that you've been injured. And you came through the surgery okay. But you can't just lay there. You're still being tired. Yes, you're still weak. You're still a little dazed and confused. And you're going to have to strengthen yourself in the Lord. Even if your legs are a little wobbly. I asked somebody, get them over the side of the bed a little bit. And take another step. And get back out of that bed. And take another step. And take another step. You've called the preacher. And we've had a prayer meeting. And this is what the Lord is telling someone this morning. Pursue without fail, you will make a full recovery. First Samuel 13, 18 and 19. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. David rescued his two wives. There was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything they had taken to them. David recovered all. And let me tell you, he recovered so well, he started blessing elders back in Israel. Read about it. And he recovered so well, he started blessing his friends. Let me read these verses. It's shorter in the NLT. 1 Samuel 30, 26 to 31. When he arrived back at Ziklag, David sent part of the plunder to the elders of Judah who were his friends. Here's a present for you taken from the Lord's enemies, he said. The gifts were sent to the people of the following towns David had visited. Bethel, Ramoth, Negev, Jader, Aror, Sifmoth, Eshtemoa, Rechel, the towns of the Jehermelites, the towns of the Kenites, Horma, Borashan, Athak, Hebron, and all the places David and his men had visited. I need you to get this picture of how low David was and how injured David was. But one day he said, I'm going to strengthen myself in the Lord. I don't care if every person in the world turns against me. I'm going to strengthen myself in the Lord, and I'm going to have a prayer meeting. When he started doing things like this and started marching back towards Ziklag, the Bible says he made a full recovery, so much so that he sent presents back to his old Sunday school teachers and sent them back to his old mentors, and every town that he preached in, powerful revival broke out. Somebody! hear me today. Swing your leg over the edge of the bed. You're about to make a full recovery. I know you've been hurt. I know you've been down. But God has sent me here. Somebody's about to step into victory. Somebody's about to step into something powerful. Stand with me if you would. I don't know who this is for. I have some people in my cranium who it would apply to. But I'm telling you, and I don't take the name of the Lord in vain. I have come here under the authority of Jesus Christ to tell somebody, you are about to make a full recovery. But it's not going to happen in a hospital bed. 
Somebody strengthen yourself in the Lord. Somebody put one foot in front of the other and get out of bed again and walk to the hall because you're about to be released. <laughs> You're about to be released from that prison you have been in. You're about to be released from those lies. You're about to be released from those enemies. Somebody take a step of faith. Somebody take a step of faith. God is about to recover everything. You shall make a full recovery. Pray together, saints. Pray. Push through. It's only the beginning when God is in it. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. 